In the back seat of a Bureau of Indian Affairs cop car, dressed in the smelly street clothes I was originally arrested in. They let me use the restroom at an all-sups outside Bernalillo, recuffing me in the front so I could urinate. I hope you got a piece of ass last night, the driver laughed, handing me a Coke and chips, because there ain't none where you're going. Going up Highway 666 north from Gallup, watching painted pinto ponies prance in cactus scrub pasture dotted with water tank windmills. I thought that even though Dad was a big drunk, he never seemed to get in messes like this. I considered myself a good enough Joe, followed the do unto others rule, had a college education, didn't talk in movies, and was nice to cats. But here I was facing five years like any random crackhead. The thing that struck me about the detention center, other than looking more like a library than a jail, was how easy it was to escape. Three inmates bolted the first two weeks I was there. The only problem was they were Hopi and the jail was on Hopi land, so they couldn't hang around the reservation because sooner or later they'd be caught and face more time. So those that went for it headed south straight for Flagstaff then to friends or relatives in Phoenix, sometimes settling in Scottsdale. But the rest of us gathered at the end of AA meetings and sang, Our God is an awesome God, by God knows whom, led by a Korean woman with manly hands and hairy knuckles. <laughs> for TV, it was either the Winter Olympics, where figure skating was popular for the chance crotch shots on falls, or the local news where the white weatherman couldn't pronounce the names of the Indian towns he was covering. Palaka, Hoktavilla, Kayenta, Shanto, Ganado, Shangapovi. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. We were in little cells, but in a wide open dormitory-like setting with our beds lined up against the walls facing a commons area where we sat playing cards. There were about 25 of us in lockup evenly divided among the young gangsters with garish multicolored tattoos, walking around with one pants leg rolled up. The middle age with sensible haircuts and kids and a wife at home. And the old guys, veterans of overseas wars, who had their social security numbers tattooed on their backs, lest they be found dead in a gully with no ID. I sailed right along the first nine months lost about 15 pounds on a red beans and skim milk diet, read every book in the library, and drew pictures on every blank page I could find. I only wrote Cynthia and Dad. I didn't want the rest of my family to know where I was. But with Dad, I didn't care. He had been locked up for drunk so many times, he was the unofficial barber for inmates and cops alike. They actually let him out on a regular basis to go get the scissors sharpened at the drugstore down the street and maybe pick up some talcum powder or menin. And he'd come right back in time for lunch, all chipper and smelling of mouthwash. You got into your routines and there were stretches where time went by fast. Little things became major benchmarks and you actually counted the days until you could go outside and watch tribal cop cars or go up to the village and kill chickens for the old ladies, or chop and stack wood for them. You were there so long you saw alcoholics come in with bloated red faces and bloodshot eyes and leave slimmed down with a confidence and skin tone back. It seemed every guy there was a master artist. Most of them were allowed to carve kachina dolls for a couple hours each night in a special workroom. The intricate but feather-like wooden figures were posed in some sort of dancing action with a foot in midstep or an outstretched hand clutching a yellow and blue stick snake. I had a nightmare one night that they all came alive and were walking around the room with their scary masks and wild-eyed expressions. I didn't know anything about kachinas, but I carved some stylized bears and horses and sent them to C Cynthia. 
The dried cottonwood root was super easy to whittle. The prisoners gave their figurines to family to sell. Then you'd see those same inmates with new Nike basketball shoes, digital Walkmans and CD players, and colorful baskets of Doritos, M&M's, Skittles, Gatorade powder, and ramen noodles. But the car ring was cut off after someone got into a fight and was caught with an exacto blade he had smuggled out of the workroom. Mostly, I talked to Psych Mike from Santa Clara Pueblo. Me and Psych Mike and the occasional Navajo were the only non-Hopis in the place. I was nearing just three months to go and had begun to think of the letter I was going to rewrite the judge when I got into a fight on the basketball court. It was always crowded out there on the cement slab. People would randomly play, take a shot, then walk around the perimeter doing jumping jacks or push-ups. The old men sat under the shade of a tree in the corner and smoked roll your own. It was a sunny spring day, but had snowed briefly that morning, leaving puddles on the slick concrete. I was thinking how the sky and the high desert terrain looked just like it did around Glorietta as you rode the train through the Sangre de Cristos heading toward Denver. clumps of juniper and sage underneath a magnified blue sky where everything was sharp and etched in clear lines. I was staring at three ravens swaying on a willow branch when the overinflated ball rocketed off my forehead with a ringing wang and staggered me to one knee. Everyone on the court started laughing and the one who threw it, a lanky long-haired teenager who was howling the loudest, shouted, shoot it homeboy, you were open. Ha, ha, ha. I pretended to walk it off while the laughter subsided and play resumed, but something inside me began to roil, merged with the stinging on my face and the echoing in my ear, and formed something called fury banging against the back of my skull. Bolts shot out my eyes. The silver in my teeth vibrated. But I jogged calmly back onto the court, Joined the flow of the game up and down, offense, then defense, until I finally had the ball in the clear. While everyone looked skyward for the shot, I pivoted and fired the spalling as hard as I could, grunting, like a pitcher stepping into a fastball. It wavered on a straight line like a bullet or missile. The teen's head snapped back and he dropped to the ground like he'd been shot, me on top of him. I pounded his pretty face four or five times before someone kicked me off him and jumped on me, and there was general melee until the officers came and broke it up. Psych Mike brought it up first. Until then, I hadn't even thought of it. Well, there goes your good behavior, he said. Oddly, the teen and I became pretty good friends after that. It was he who came up and apologized first after a few weeks when he was sure no one was looking. Around the other gangsters, he mad-dogged me and acted like he wanted to beat my ass. I told him not to worry about it, and we shook hands. He was actually a pretty likable guy, sort of like a little brother. We always teamed up in dominoes and were workout partners lifting weights. The scary thing was I think he enjoyed the whole brawl. He was in jail for committing the grievous sin of bootlegging whiskey and beer on the reservation where it's outlawed. He said he and his cousin would drive to Winslow and bring back Bud Light, Jack Daniels, and Coors by the case and sell it out of a shed in the back of his mom's house. They would quadruple their money selling cases of beer for 70 bucks. But their operation came crashing down when they sold to an undercover cop who had videoed the whole thing on his cell phone. At night, slipping in fits and starts for weeks, convinced the teen would sneak over and stab me with a buck knife. I began to think of what Psych Mike had said. 